Thank you, congregation. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we are always blessed when you're in our, we're in your presence. And we pray this afternoon that you'll meet with us again. In a great way to do the, the unexpected for us again today. This day is given to pray for the sick. We set this aside. I pray, Lord Jesus, that there will not be any feeble among us when we leave. I thank you for letting me have favor with these people. May the things that I've said, Lord, may they reign true to the people, for it's thy word. Now, we're expecting you to meet with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. to thank Brother Winters and for this fine group of ministers that's uh, cooperated, sponsored in this meeting, for all the ministers who cooperated, for every person that's come, and for your great support and the spiritual side. Uh, it's been easy to speak. It's been hard to get off the platform for me. I could just stay for hours. And and for all that you have done, we thank the people, the fairground here, the trustees or however it's controlled, for giving us the privilege of having this place. For every church, I pray that God will multiply your members and will raise you up in the spirit and just do the exceedingly abundantly above all that you've been expecting. May you do more than that. I thank the Christian businessmen, the full gospel businessmen for their fine support too, for helping us here. Brother Paul King, he was here with us today, I suppose he's been so here sitting right behind me. He's younged up a whole lot. I hardly know him anymore. He used to be kind of fat, but he's thinned up a little, and I hardly can tell him anymore. Seen him the other night in a vision at the, down at the Ramada Inn to a lady he prayed for, and uh, he had been pray, she had been prayed for by him before. I couldn't make him out for a while. I was watching the vision. I said, he's some man. But I, when he, uh, well, the vision was closer, and I seen that, I said, it's Paul King. He, he's one straight for you. And, uh, and she, she was healed. So we're grateful to the Lord for his goodness and mercy. Friends, there's no way to express what we think. And we know that we're going to meet one of these times together as a group as we are now for our last time. We don't know... Uh, when that time will be. The lovely pastor here with you congregation invited me back again. I was so happy when he said, if this be the will of the Lord, I always like to go that way. I've never let my meetings grow in such a caliber until I couldn't go wherever the Lord sent me. Wherever, if it was down to where these five people, one person, if he wants me to preach to, well, I preached to 500,000 at one time in Bombay, India. And I preached in Durban, South Africa to around... 200,000 or more had 30,000 converts one afternoon to Christ we're all natives and then I held a revival just recently in a church that you couldn't pack in over 20 and well, now the brothers who's got big ministries they couldn't come to a place like that because they just couldn't afford to do it they got have lots of money to do it and God has blessed them and I certainly appreciate them especially uh, Paul King here Oral Roberts and many of those great warriors of the faith. I feel little stand before them. They're smart, educated, intelligent men and work for the Lord and the Lord has called them to work and they're doing their work. I, I could not take their place and the Lord knew that. I, I couldn't handle things the way they do. That's the reason he keeps me humble, I guess. And this lets me stay like this. But I can go into the fronts and the forefronts and lay a foundation that when there's enough gets together, they can see the big ministers, the ministers. That, they're not big ministers. I don't mean that. There's no big and little among us. We're just the same, you see. But man who had such responsibilities that they maybe couldn't get into a place where they have to have many thousands of dollars a day to carry on the televisions and the supports. And I always like to speak for those men so that people can help them, you know, because they really need help. And we're for everything that stands for Jesus Christ. We're for that. Now, when I was first ordained, it was in the Missionary Baptist Church with Dr. Roy E. Davis. And then I wasn't thrown out. I just come out because I could walk between the churches and what ministry he's given me, not put it up on any certain denominations, but put our arms around each other and say, we're brethren. Let's walk on. So I'm thankful for your invitation. 
They just tell me out there they took a love offering. Well, I, I didn't deserve that and didn't ask for it. But being that you did it, I'll do my very best if the expenses are paid. If the expenses isn't paid, put it in to that. If they are if paid, then you know what I do with that? Put it in foreign missions. Then go over there myself. So that I know that this ministry that you have supported, I take it to the people who cannot afford to do it. Then they don't cost them a penny. People who doesn't even know which is right and left hand, laying out there eating what they can find to eat, and some of them starving on the streets, and they, I try to take it to them and bring the message the best that I can, uh, the same way that you see it done here, and God honors it, and your money is designated. Frankly, I don't even see it. Don't count it. It's put right into a fund, and that fund can only be spent for overseas missions. That's all. I don't live by it. The church gives me my living, $100 a week. That's all I get, $100 a week. And then the, these funds go to help spread the gospel. And they are in a separate funds controlled by the Tabernacle Trustee Board. And so it cannot be spent upon myself or any individual or any other thing but overseas mission. And then when we get enough build up there so we don't have to ask them for it or beg them for money when we get there, don't even take an offering or nothing, go in there and spend your money. So I feel that you are a partner with me helping getting these things out. And when the Lord gets so much up like that, then I feel the urge to go somewhere and I take off. Pray for me, will you? Uh, that's what I want you to do is pray for me. Bless you. If I never see you again, this side of the river, the morning, when it's all be awful dark down there, just, just hold your token. Just remember. Go down to the boat. He'll let you on. Your fare is already paid. Be sure you got the token now. That's all he'll recognize. Now, let us stand just a minute again in honor of the Word. Now, we're about 30 minutes, 35 minutes late. I won't speak for just a few moments because we're going to have a prayer line calling up all peoples who has their prayer cards to pray for them. That's our promise. But now we're standing in respects of the Word while I read a portion of Scripture here and ask God for a context for my text. We are turning to Hebrews 11th chapter, if you'd like to follow as we read. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Let's pray. Lord, bless your word. Sanctify the instrument that it shall be used for. And may the instrumentality be to go together with the word to bring forth life and make this word live again before us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And be seated. Just give me your undivided attention just for a few moments, about 20 minutes. I have a little catch here. I'd like to call it countdown. You know, all the things, did you hear what the Scripture said? The things that are we see were made of things that was not, because it was the Word of God who spoke things into existence. The world that we are sitting upon today the chairs that we're sitting in, the floor that's beneath us, the dirt, the trees, everything is nothing but the interpretation of the Word of God. When God interprets it, when it happens, that reveals it. Let there be, and there was. Let there be, and there was. And to see nature, how it is formed. Now, nature has been my Bible. As everyone knows who I've been in my audience when I spoke, I'm really almost on the illiterate side. And just barely read. I had a seventh grade education. I had a lot of experience. But in my preaching, I have to take my inspiration and type it with something in the in nature so that you can understand what I'm talking about. I can't use words like a smart, educated man does because I haven't the education to do it with. So therefore, I pick up nature and type what my inspiration is telling me with nature. I felt awful lonesome for that, but one time I read in the Bibles where the prophets of the Old Testament did that. And then the greatest of the prophets was John. And we noticed 
When he was nine years old, he was carried into the wilderness by the Spirit because he had to introduce the Messiah. His father was a priest. It was ordinarily that is, he would have followed the trend of his father. But his job was too important to take some ethics of what somebody else thought. He had to get his message from God. So at the age of 30, he came out of the wilderness uneducated, but with a burning zeal in his heart, with a revelation from God and a vision that he was going to announce the Messiah. He knew it so plainly until he said, there's one standing among you right now that you don't know. Think of that. One standing among you right here that you don't know. He, his shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. But he will baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. His fan is in his hand. And did you notice his, his manner of speech? Now he said to the Pharisees when he come out, he knew being a prophet, he knew what was in their heart. And he said, you generation of vipers, meaning snakes. See, they, he knew that, that now some other man might have said you something else, you know, you some, a, a good high grammar, you, uh, insignificant piece of inconvenience or whatever you might have wanted to call it. That might be wrong. I just picked that up. See? Uh, so it, it might have been some other words that he could have used. But you see, his inspiration, he knew that a snake was little and low down and sneaking. So he said, you generation of snakes, who's warned you to flee from the wrath that's to come? Don't begin to say within yourselves that we belong to this or that. For I say unto you that God's able of these rocks, stones, what he'd seen in the wilderness and on the bank, to raise up children unto Abraham. Also the axe is laid at the root of the tree, what he'd seen. Every tree, like in the wilderness, didn't bring forth fruit. That's what he used for firewood, see. It laid at the root of the tree. And if it don't bring forth good fruit, it's hewed down and cast into the fire. See, his inspiration followed nature. And if you watch nature real close, you won't get too far from the Word because God is in nature. I think the last time I was down on the West Coast, I preached on the four ways of seeing God. God in His Son, God in His Word, God in nature, and so forth. Now, if we notice everything that God made in nature, being able to speak that way on natural things, typing spiritual things, it, because it was made of things which does not appear, it was the Word. Now we take, for instance, like... Yeah, a few months ago, I was asked to preach a sermon, a funeral sermon, for a dear old friend of mine. Many of you have read my book. And you remember where I, a boy that was a, belonged to some of the Boy Scouts or something, and he, I asked him to save, him my, uh, save me his old cow, uh, or scout suit when he wore it out. Well, he saved me one leg, and you remember it in the book, and I put it on. Lloyd Ford, his mother died recently, about 85 years old, a very precious friend of mine. And Lloyd, being single yet and stayed with his mother, he came to me and he said, Brother Bill, that's how he knew me. We, I called him Lloyd. He called me Bill. And I said, uh, what do you want, Brother Lloyd? He said, will you, uh, will you preach Mother's funeral? I said, I'd be glad to do it. It would be like my own mother. Oh, I said, she's cooked me so many meals and things and been so sweet to me. He said, I want you to say those last words over, Brother Branham. I said, what would you, what would you want me to say, Lloyd? He said, one thing I want you to do. Just to assure my people and sure us of her resurrection. So I took the text from something over in Job uh, of how that Job was watching nature. And I said, in my death of my own mother, my own mother that just died about two years ago, my young sister had just been saved a little while, and she called me up when she knew mother was going, and she said, uh, Bill, what can I do? said, I just can't stand it no longer. Standing there looking upon my mother, I said, it's the sweetest sight i ever seen. She said, how can you say that to your mother? Why? Oh, I said, she's ready to go and wanting to go. She's old and she's ready to pass in this life. I said to her, Mother, does Jesus still mean to you what he did the day you got the Holy Ghost? She'd say yes. When, and I, when she couldn't do it no more, I said, smile. When she got so low she couldn't smile or speak, I said, Mother, you're dying. She's in my arm. I said, Mother, if Jesus Christ still means the same to you, and it is as sweeter, even sweeter than he was when you received the Holy Ghost, I'm your preacher's son. I've got to meet the public. Does Jesus mean something to you while you're dying? If it is, if you can't speak, she couldn't speak. I said, can't you speak, Mother? She couldn't move. I said, bat your eyes real fast. And she started batting her eyes real fast. And the water running down her cheeks when she couldn't even speak. No more. But her senses in her sense the presence of Jesus Christ. In a few minutes, a wind comes sweeping through the room. And Mother went out with it to meet God. Now, 
This woman, when she died, I said, is there hopes in the resurrection? I said, everything I've been privileged of speaking practically to every nation of the heavens. I've seen all kinds of gods and all kinds of religions. But there's none of it true but Christianity. It's the only one. Even nature itself it speaks for Christianity. God the Creator. Look, there is life, death, burial, resurrection. Resurrection. The, you can't go outside without seeing it. Watch the leaves come on in the spring. Watch them get to their youth and their old and their middle age and then their old age and the veins and the leaves packing the life. A few minutes, you find out it isn't long before any frost falls or anything. Them leaves drop off and what happens? The life that's in that tree, that sap goes down into the roots. If it didn't, the winter cold would kill the tree, kill the life. It can't stay up. It's got to go down and bury itself. But in the spring of the year, here it comes back with a new leaf again. It's testifying there is a life, a death, a burial, a resurrection. Everything typing. We just can't get from it. Watch the sun when it rises of a morning. The sun that lights the skies. It's a little baby rocked in its mother's arms. When it's weak, not very much light, not very strong. Then about 8 o'clock it starts off to school. At 11.30 she's graduated. And it's out of high school, not of college. Then she's in her strength from about 12 till about 2. Then she begins to get weak. Weaker, weaker, weaker. And finally she gets real weak like an old man or a woman. Goes down. Is that the end of it? She comes back the next morning to testify there is a resurrection and a life beyond death. Everything testifies. All nature testifies. The Word testifies to it. The very Spirit itself that's in our heart testifies to it. Something within us calling out that there is a resurrection of the dead. So you see, to say, if everything serves God's purpose, it's got a resurrection. But it can only rise if it serves God's purpose. If a flower lives and is not germatized, it will not rise again. If you plant corn and it is not germatized, it will not rise again. Anything that doesn't serve God's purpose has no resurrection. But you can't keep anything in the ground that serves God's purpose. It comes forth again to testify of the resurrection. We know that all these things are right. They are testimonies to us to encourage us. Each day, everywhere you look, you see God. There is a natural body of people. There is a spiritual body of people. There is a natural bride. I've had the privilege of marrying fine young couples. I never think of it unless I uh, kind of turn them around a little superstitions and I face with my back to the east and them looking to the east. And as I look at them, I think of their hearts beating as one, Christ and his bride. There is a natural bride. And if there is a natural bride, it's only a testimony. There is a spiritual bride. There is a spiritual bride because there is a natural bride. All these natural happenings now, they forerun spiritual happenings. Each happening accompanies the other happening, only it improves it. You say, what's like that? Well, something like a spiritual life, when it comes into the natural life, it improves the natural life. It, it makes you in a better condition than you was in the natural life. When the leaf is getting old and dies, when it comes back with the life again in the resurrection to testify in another year, it comes back in a better condition than it did when it went down. See, everything testifies of these things. Now, let's take, for instance, the achievement that man has been uh, able to do on earth in all of these natural achievements now. If, I want your undivided attention now. The, all the natural achievements uh, that's happened in the earth has been forerunners of spiritual achievements that God has done by His church. All the natural things are type of the spiritual things. Now you say, how is that? Let's take for one transportation. First, the transportation was by horse. The next, it was by automobile. Then science built us an airplane. And but you see, it is, uh, first was one horsepower. The car was maybe 20 horsepower. The airplane goes up to hundreds of horsepower. See what it is? It's just as we come on with the horse, then an automobile was made, then the next thing was an airplane. We just keep achieving on higher and higher, going greater and greater. This is the achievement of science. This is a forerunner of the spiritual things that's happened of God, 
by his Spirit has been in his promised word, the natural man by the knowledge looks backward for his achievement. That's science. See, to what God has done in a former creation. They go out and pick up clods and get pieces of rocks and fossils and, and elements and ties them together. See, on that achievement, they are taking what God has done and perverting it from its original estate and making his living quarters and so forth and his economy a little better by what has been created. That's in the natural achievement by man. But God, in the spiritual achievement, is going forward. Not going backward. He's going forward, looking into the Word and believing the promises for things that never has come yet. For the spiritual revelations to manifest the spiritual things that God has promised. He sees them come to pass just as the scientists in his laboratory are working on different things to help man take in creation. The spiritual man is looking forward to something that God promised that has never yet been created. The natural man looks backward. The spiritual man looks forward. That's the way they got, got that in the church. The natural church member looks back and says, What? Finney, Sankey, Knox, Calvin. That was all right. But that was their day. We're looking forward for something else. A promise that's greater and higher than what God has promised. Science goes back to pick it up. We go forward in the Word of the Lord to find what God has achieved. And these two things, one foreruns the other, are types. Now, as science has been able to achieve a more horsepower, as uh, he did by taking the power and uh, making greater instruments, the autos and aeroplanes, God has achieved from the same manner as each one of those types. Now watch. Way back in the days of Luther, their power was horsepower. And then God, by getting Luther in his hands, controlled out of a great organization or a system, he let the man see that the just shall live by faith. And when he was able to achieve justification and preach it, the church come to life. It come to life. It began to move just a little bit. Back under the days of the horsepowers, when horsepower was about ready to fade out of the carriage and horse and buggy. Now, he achieved justification, and through that, then the church received life by believing on Jesus Christ. Not taking some, you say, I believe the church, I believe this. To believe Him is life. Amen. Justified by faith. Luther preached it. That was typed by the horse and buggy days. Then he got a man in England by the name of John Wesley under his control to take out all the isms away from him. And he was able by John Wesley to bring into the church sanctification. Sanctification raised the church to its feet and got it able to walk. Now, at the end of Wesley's age was the automobile. We realized it went to the end of the Wesley church. I mean, not see ever, ever a reformer comes at the end of the age. Now, we find out that Wesley, in last of his church age, it come in just before the Pentecostals. Well, we see that the church got strength enough to sanctification to walk away from the things of the world. Sanctify means separate for the glory of God. It, uh, too bad it lost that. But um, it uh, got strength enough. Luther gave it life back in the horse and buggy day. Wesley got it on its feet to walk in sanctification, separating from the things of the world. Through that come the little branches off like the pilgrim holiness and Nazarenes and whatever more come from that through sanctification. But remember, they couldn't stay still. The pillar of fire moved out and they come to Azusa Street here in California. And then what did it do? It represented the airplane days from the automobile when they, God was able, but the Wright brothers, to, or the man was, to achieve an airplane that could fly. Immediately forerunning that, the Azusa Street Pentecost fell and man took to the air, into the supernatural, to the unknown. He spoke with unknown tongues. He done unknown things that was foreign to the church because he had tuck off on the ground. He had left the air, into the air. What did it? Immediately after the airplanes come on, he tucked to the air. God showed by the airplanes that his church was arising. 
He shows by the natural things what's happening in the spiritual. They always follow, just like the wise man following the star to find Christ after following for two years. Now, notice, all those things are achievements that man has achieved, only are types and shadows of what God is doing. He always does it that way. He's told us the signs that would be in the skies, the things that would be happening just before the coming of Christ. We see that now. It's only a pointing post. And we see signs, how they have achieved and how God has achieved by His church. Does a man ride in an airplane? He don't want no horse and buggy no more, unless he just wants a little fun. But the horse and buggy, remember, what is the power in the airplane? Just more horses added, that's all. And so when John Wesley found sanctification, a set-aside work from justification, he never condemned justification. He only added more power to it. And when the Pentecostals found the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the restoration of the gifts, they never denied sanctification or justification. They just got more power and raised up. He went up because he found more power. See, all those things foreshadowing as they come up. If we had time, we could really stay on that, but we haven't. But he raised up as science achieved something looking backward. God achieves going this way, going forward to the kingdom. Now we find from Azusa Street the planes took off in great revivals and swept the world to the unknown in the heavenly places speaking unknown tongues with unknown gifts to the world while they thought they were fanatics but they had been able. God got a group of people in His hands. Got a little cross-eyed Negro man down here in Azusa Street that had no more sense than to believe what God said was the truth. That's right. See, when a science has got to get a lot of sense in a man's head, of wisdom, of knowledge, to go back and find these things, God's got to get what He's got in Him out of Him so He can use Him. Amen. One going this way and one going that way. One's going down, the other's going up. Amen. Now, she left these intellectual churches grounded. When the Pentecostal took off with speaking in tongues and great gifts of healing, they healed the sick, they done great Things, they've done it. There's no doubt of what they've done it. It's a proof that they've done it. Amen. Sure it is. And they left this intellectual church sitting on the ground. No matter they say, well, you can't... Go. They did it anyhow. <laughs> Whether you, like the little boy in jail for a shooting a gumbo, somebody come in, said, a little boy come in to visit, he said, oh, they can't put you in jail for that. He said, they can't. <laughs> he is already there. And that's the way they say that the Holy Ghost was for another age that's what they think. It's here. We know it. We, it, it it's, we've been flying in the air for the last 40, 50 years with it. Seeing things that the intellectual people know nothing about. Only thing they can do is sit down and say, uh, just make fun of it. Like a little calf one time come out of a stall. They said and it was just fat and round. He's kicking up his heels. And he had a very fine a farmer fed him good. And he's all round and full of vitamins. And there's another old lazy farmer over there that had a little calf also born in the barn that winter when the little fella hadn't eaten nothing but weeds. And when he come out, he was so poor he couldn't hardly move. And every time the wind would blow and shove him sideways, he seen this little old fat calf just kicking up his heels and having a great time. You know, he looked to the crack of the fence and said, such fanaticism. <laughs> he was all full of vitamin. No wonder he could kick up his heels. And when a man is filled with the Holy Ghost, there's something in him that's full of God's spiritual vitamin. It makes him praise God, shout, and act different because why? He's no longer earthbound. He's in the heavens, sailing around in his heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He left them earthbound with their bicycles and automobiles. <laughs> and they went to the air. Yes, sir. Practically taking them out of, they're out of date. They healed the sick. They spoke in unknown languages and done many things. But now, friends, may I say this, it has come to the age of astronaut. We've moved out of the airplane age. we got more power now. The astronaut age has come in. What is it? Not a... We've come into a spiritual age of astronaut. See? Going above. It's not... It's the same spirit, only more power. Only lifted higher can go higher. See more. Believe more. Be more like Christ. Not the automobile. Not the horse and buggy. Not even the airplane. But the astronaut. He sweeps on and above each one. It's called the eagle age in the Bible. 
God calls His prophets eagle age. We realize over in the Bible we find in Malachi 4 that we're promised that in the last days. Now, He likes His prophets to eagles. He calls Himself eagle. He's the great Jehovah eagle. He's able to achieve to Himself a bride. He's going to, in the last days, be able to get a bride that with a ministry that so exactly the, like a man and his wife becomes one. And when Jehovah gets his people like him, then he lives in his people. They are one. It fulfills the scripture. Exactly what he said in St. John 14, 12. He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he also. And also fulfill what Jesus said would take place as it was in the days of Sodom. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Now is the astronaut age. And the astronaut sees things that the horse rider automobile or airplanes either sees. He goes high. Airplanes still down here bouncing around in the clouds and having blowouts and hit downs and everything else. But he goes beyond the clouds of creeds and denominations. Mm-hmm. Moves on up into the heavens. I'm away from everything. The astronaut age. We are living in the astronaut age. Just as sure as God has testified to the natural happenings there, so is He testifying now. That if we've achieved an astronaut, God has achieved what He promised to achieve in the last days according to Malachi 4. only thing He has to do is get somebody in His hands that can cut loose from the airplanes and automobiles and what more. Not look back to what it was, but more power to lift Him higher. Lift Him into the presence of God. Lift Him up there where all things are possible. Now we see it's happening. There's no doubt to it. So does a spiritual astronaut. As a, the natural astronaut goes on above the planes, the planes always wrecking up and fussing in the clouds and everything like that. There can be nothing greater, no more achievement than the astronaut. Only thing he has to do is keep up more power. He'll go anywhere he wants to. See, because he's done gone into space, airplanes are still down wrecking, fussing, grounded, and everything like that. But the astronaut don't have to be grounded. He goes on above the clouds. He goes on above. On above the creed. On above the denomination. On above those say it is and so it is and so. He's got a guide. The Holy Spirit. The Word tells him so. And he moves on. How does the science make an astronaut? He takes what power they got. Just keep breaking something into it. It'll make it go farther. Go without air and so forth. He keeps... I don't know the... The chemicals of it, I'm not a mechanic. But whatever it is, he keeps making it go higher and higher. He keeps improving at all times. And now he can go beyond any reason. So does God's astronaut. Goes beyond all church creed, all boundaries, all these things. Says the days of miracles is past. There is no such a thing. How did the astronaut find this? He figured it out on paper. It come off of paper what he'd figured out. The same thing that any man can sit down and read the Word of God and see what's promised. Amen. Search the scriptures in them you think you have eternal life, said Jesus, and they testify of me. That earthbound bunch they had back there in them days didn't know what he was. Ministries, what does it? The astronaut sees things that the planes and everything's out of date. So does the spiritual astronaut. Goes beyond the clouds and beyond creeds and beyond doubt. Out into outer space. (laughs) Outer space of all unbelief. Outer space where you don't hear the chatter saying, well, you can't do it. Nobody cooperate, cooperate with you. You can't do this. You can't do that. He doesn't notice it. He's an astronaut. He goes on beyond those clouds. It's too stormy. We can't make it. It don't make any difference to an astronaut. He goes beyond the storm. See? That's the way it is to a real astronaut faith today. They say, well, the doctor said so and so. That might be all right. But an astronaut don't believe that. When he's wrote here and he's got it in his heart, something tells him he just propels right on out. It all goes right on out into the space because we're living in an astronaut age. Yes, sir, out in space where all things are possible to them that believe. He has a guide, which is his word, that tells him how to go. The word of God. Natural astronaut is, has uh, something to control him. When the astronaut is in the air, he has something backwards here. Back down here on the earth that controls him is called radar. That radar moves him around, sells where he's at, tells what he's doing, and that radar controls him from a radar tower here on earth. That's the natural astronaut. So the spiritual astronaut has a control power. 
has a control tower, too. It's not down here like man is. It's up there. And it's the Holy Ghost that's in him that's controlling him. A tower of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's under control. Keeps him in control by the Word. Not in a bunch of fanaticism, some hooped up nonsense, but thus saith the Lord. And it happens. It's always under control. He's got a control tower. That's the Holy Ghost. And the Word is his, his program. And he lays right into that program. And the power of the Holy Ghost endows him to move out and it brings the achievement that God wants to be achieved for his people that it might fulfill what he promised. Jesus did not heal the people because he had to do it. He fulfilled the scripture. He healed because it was written he would do it. He don't have to show these signs today. He don't have to have a ministry of such and such. But he promised he would do it. He does it to fulfill his promise. Brother, sister, man, women, can't you see that? Can't you see the type of the spiritual and the natural? These great achievements has brought the time clock of science and it broke into such a place until they say now it's only on the clock of science. They say it's three minutes till midnight. They're at the end. They found the thing that will destroy them. They found everything an astronaut can get in the air and go over with atomic powers and set up there and say, surrender or be blown up. Three minutes until midnight. They have worked on what God has done. They've been able to pervert. Instead of trying to make life, they're always trying to find something to kill somebody. Something will outdo the next thing. Beat the next nation. Beat the next place. That's what they're trying to do. But man looks on, calling man his brother, trying to lead him to a home where he won't have to die. One is in death, the other is in life. But these in death only represent life. The leaf, when it falls off a tree and dies, only means it's coming back again. Because it has been. The clock ticks up on the achievement of science today to three minutes to midnight. On God's great clock, it ticks Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. We have arrived. The works that I do shall you also. Jesus Christ the same Yesterday, today, and forever, when the scientific clock says three minutes to destruction, God's clock says Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. He's on the earth in the power of the Holy Ghost to make His Word live and do for His church just exactly what He promised it would do. Filling His astronauts, getting them all fueled up and ready. So, they got in their great big scientific tube here not long ago, astronaut tube, and are taking the countdown now headed for the moon. They're getting off of here too. They've got an astronaut in a big tube powered by atomic power that they can send it plumb to the moon, they claim. They got in their tube and are waiting for the countdown. The spiritual astronaut got in Christ and is listening to the countdown of the Word. Amen. Amen. Now you Lutheran order to shout, you Baptist and Presbyterian. Watch the countdown of the Word. Oh my, countdown of the Word. And they're headed for heaven. Not to the moon. They'll pass the moon so fast they won't even see it. <laughs> oh my, waiting for the countdown. Yes, sir. Waiting for the countdown is right. What are they doing? They're wrapped in Christ in rapture and grace. Nothing they did themselves. Christ took the uneducated, the foolish things of the world, wrapped his astronauts in it, and empowered them with the Holy Ghost to take off. This world's going to be left alone. That's right. Take it off. Notice, the natural man even counts backwards. I said he did things backwards. He counts backwards. Watch his count. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. See? He goes back and starts counting. See? He's all up. Ten's a bad number. That's right, to start with ten. It's a bad number. They had ten tribes of Israel. And that was just all carnal. And he had to take Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, the prophet's children, and bless them. And when he did, his hands crossed. And he said, Father, not so. You put your hands on Ephraim. It should be on Manasseh. He said, God crossed my hands. Yeah. From the, taking it from the older son, the law, and putting it up over on Christ. And through that come to the cross came the change of the birthright. Amen. To the younger son. Yeah. Oh, my. How wonderful. If we had time to go into that, we'll some other time. All right. 
Now, ten is a bad number, but man always counts backwards. Starts at ten. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. What does God do? He starts with His number, seven. That's God's number. Watch Him, seven. Oh, He counts ahead, starting with one. He starts with His first church age. That's what His symbols was on earth, the seven church ages. He made the world in seven days. Seventh day He rested. That's His last number. In His creation, He rested. Notice, He counts straight ahead, not backwards. He goes forward. He starts from His first church age, which began in AD 33, and He started the countdown. He counted his church ages. That was the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. What did he start counting? He started counting the church ages. First one was Ephesus, number one. Two, Samaria. Three, Pergus. Four, Thyatira. Five, Sardis. Six, Philadelphia. Seven, Laodicea. That's yeah. later than you think. Yes, it is. It's later than you think. The counting's over. The next thing is zero. Let's go. Everything's ready. The counting's over. When John Glenn, our astronaut, got into that big tube to take off, the nation stood speechless. They didn't know that morning that he took off. When he did, he got in the tube and everybody was crying and waiting and watching what was going to happen. The nation stood spellbound. You've seen the, all the televisions blaring and everything so everybody could sit. Their natural eye couldn't sit. But of course, they put it on television. You remember it. Then when he got placed up in the tube just right, and when he did, they started 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Off he went. What happened? When the big lever pulled, the atomics began to catch fire, begin to break, fire began to fly, smoke began to roll, and the great big tube took off for the air into the unknown out there somewhere. He took off. In the man's achievement, the greatest he's ever had. But let me tell you, that's just a very small thing. One of these mornings, God's achievement of his astronauts has climbed into Jesus Christ, been born in there by the Holy Ghost, filled with his power. One of these mornings, a whole universe will be screaming and wailing and gnashing of teeth when they see they missed it, when the great eagle, powered by the Holy Ghost and fire, begins to spread her wings. The astronauts will take off into the sky to go to meet the bridegroom. When the bride takes off in the astronaut power of God Almighty who sent Jesus Christ to the earth in the form of the Holy Ghost has brought the church through these achievements until now she's getting resurrected power in her. The power beyond the things of the world. Seeing him out here in the church making himself the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, sir, the countdown's even over. Every church age is done past. We're ending on the Lady Osea. Get in, my brother, sister. Get pressurized. The pressure won't hurt you uh, when you get on the inside and get pressurized. Get in Christ. You don't care what the world says. They can't never hit you anyhow. You're safe. You're tucked in. Jesus Christ is our great, uh, glorious astronaut tube that we'll be in. That will be propelled by the Holy Ghost and power and fire. When she begins to fly one of these mornings, the Holy Ghost fire hit the earth like that. And when he do, the church will be lifted up and all the nations will stand. They won't need television. They'll see him. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess as she propels her way in or into the glorious rims of, of heaven to be married to her bridegroom. God help us to live for that day. Let us bow our heads. Are you driving a horse and buggy today? Are you riding a bicycle? Are you a automobile? Or have you got up into the clouds with a plane? If you have, I've got something to tell you. There's an astronaut age on now. Why don't you come get into the astronaut? Oh, I know it sounds scary. The first man ever got in an airplane like scaring to death. First one had an automobile. You know what done? But now it's a common thing. Oh, brother, sister, Jesus Christ is here. The great astronaut tube that we're to be in. Cloud over us won't mean one thing. He'll break every cloud of doubt, everything of unbelief, and sweep out and enter into the space. If you haven't got into him yet, 
you have an opportunity this afternoon, would you raise your hands and say, pray for me, Brother Branham, that I can walk into that place where I can see every word that God promised. I can see and feel a, a pulsating power of God within me that I know that my this world and things has gone from me. God bless. Just look at the hands. My, oh my. All everywhere. Our Heavenly Father, you see their hands. I'm only responsible for preaching the word. You, they are yours. I give them to you. They are yours. Let the Holy Spirit now, and may they see that these achievements they see it in the natural then if we look back we see it in the spiritual you're here Lord you promised just before the end time come that as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and we had look back and see those days look there and see where two ministers outstanding angelic anointed man went down in Sodom and preached in the days of Abraham, calling out Lot. Then there was one stayed with Abraham. And that was the one who done a sign to Abraham. The others, and Sodom did their sign. And Father, so many things could be said right here. Maybe the church wouldn't understand. But I pray that you'll give them such a crave for it, Lord, that they'll come and see we're at the end time. The astronaut age. I pray, Father, that they'll realize it isn't trying to condemn what they have. It's only trying to give them more rapturing grace. For the hour will come when we'll have to have rapture power. Not only to heal the body, but to change it in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Christ will be so real into their bodies so he can change it by his great death and what he purchased. May they take this today, that token that I spoke of last night, hold it before them and walk into this astronaut. Grant it, Father, where visions, powers, and be worlds beyond known, and, oh God, where all the great mysteries of God is unfolded in those seven seals and made known to man. Grant it, Father. They're yours now. I realize that altar calls is what we do, but Lord, you said as many as believed. I pray that you'll give them faith to believe. They're in your hands, Lord. And if I never see and they never see me no more until we meet at your side, we'll know them as we are known. I pray that you'll help them and may we all be there safely, carried through by amazing grace of our great astronaut faith that we have in Jesus Christ where we're in, housed with him. Amen. Now, just one moment. We're going to pray for the sake. God, we promise to do it. We want to do it. And now, I want to say this, that through the week, now we're just about 15, 20 minutes now. I cut a little bit off, so i got about 15, 20 minutes yet that we can do this. Now, the first thing is, these things that we're talking about, are they so? Are they not? We know the Bible promises, but is He here? God is here to do what we what he promised that he would do. God is here. See, we've gone beyond speaking with tongues. That's, that's all right. See, we've gone beyond these little things. That See, we're into a place now where we've got to have astronaut faith. That's astronaut power to realize that we're in Christ already. Just more of Christ. See, to lift us up into heavenly places. The old method of praying, laying hands on the sick. That's good. That was Luther's days, friend, back in the automobile or so forth. We're beyond that now. Remember Jesus come to the Jews the old days? Z uh, Jairus, said, Jairus said, come and lay your hands upon my daughter and she'll live. But the Roman said, I'm not worthy that you come. Just speak the word. See, to re he recognized the power of Christ, that he was over all things. Now, if Christ is over all things, he's, he's got to keep his word. He's king. He's God. He must keep his word. The works that I do shall you also. Now, as far as healing somebody, nobody can do it because it's already done. Amen. It's already done. It's just the recognition of it. See? The recognition that he is in our presence. Do you believe that? Yes. Now, pray for a few minutes. Say, God, be merciful. Heavenly Father, that the people might know there might be strangers here. That they might know that this that I speak of is true. I, I'm just... In my poor, humble way, Lord, I try to present the gospel the best that I know how. Lord, may the people overlook my grammar and just realize what I'm trying to say. I pray that you'll confirm this and make it real for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, friends, there's probably two or three hundred prayer cards here. 
It would be hard for me to ever take them up here one by one. If you got about four or five of that discernment, I'd be laying on the floor perhaps. Maybe you're so weak, I wouldn't even know. A vision, when you see a vision, it's got to be interpreted to you many times. It just isn't just exactly. It's just got... Now, you do that yourself. Your own faith is... The woman's faith touched the Lord Jesus. And she believed that he was, a, he was God's son. And it drawed the power from him to her, give her desires. And he turned around and told her her condition had been healed. See, thy faith has saved thee. Now, these scholars sitting here, I know that word is sozo. Thy word has saved thee. Thy faith has saved thee. Just like your faith saves you from sin, your faith saves you physically. See? From sickness. Now, you must believe it. I'm asking all to be real quiet and real reverent for a few minutes. And may the Holy Spirit... Now, just at least two or three people in this audience is all I ask for. That you might see that it just isn't spontaneous and whatever more. The Holy Spirit is here to manifest Himself. Now, somebody in the audience... I don't know one person outside of my beloved sister Upshaw sitting here that I can see in the audience at this time that I know. She's the only one. And now, I can't... It's just like your conscience. See, your subconscious is where you dream. I had a physical examination here a couple, three years ago about time, wave, brain wave, you know. And when the doctors come out, they said, Hey, you're a funny guy. I said, What's the matter? I said, You know what? I said, You could dream when you're wide awake. I said, What? I said, You can dream when you're wide awake. I said, said, here's your first conscience. said, it's controlled by your, seven, uh, your six senses. See, taste, feel, smell, and smell. Your first conscience is only active as long as you're in the six senses. said, here is your subconscious. said, when these are inactive, then you go to your subconscious. When these are inactive, you're asleep. And you go over here and dream a dream. Some part of it goes over there. Then when you come back over here, said, then you remember what you dreamed when you was out of your senses. The feel, taste, me, smell, and hear. See? And said, that's ordinary. He said, we never seen it before. But both of yours are laying right here together. Yeah. said, both of your timing waves from subconscious and your other conscience. Now, I've never heard of it before in my life. I said, man, you could dream a dream standing up and wide awake. I said, did, doctor, did you ever hear of a vision? He said, no, I don't believe I ever did. I said, are you a believer? He said, I'm Presbyterian, Brother Branham. But said, that's all. He said, the pastor's got some uh, people down there over Thursday night. said, all I hear is Presbyterian, Presbyterian, Presbyterian. So I don't even go down. I said, did you ever read the Bible? He said, I have. Did you ever hear what the old prophets of the Old Testament went off in another dimension? He said, is that what you're talking about? I said, that's it. I said, he said, well, that would be wonderful. Say, Brother Bram, you ought to go. I said, I've already been interviewed by males. See? And I said, uh, he, I said, but look, do you ever dream a dream, doctor? He said, oh, sure. I said, dream me a dream, then. Just go to sleep and dream me a dream. Tell me what to do. You couldn't do it. But ever who controls you could give you a dream of me, and then you could wake up and tell it. I can't do it either. I can't say what in here. It's got to be Him that does it. And your faith in Him confirms this word. Just that woman, no matter what anybody said, she believed if she could touch His garment, it would be, it would happen. Now, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, that's the only thing that is you see, when you see impersonations and so forth, friend, it kind of makes you a little upset, but just go on anyhow. It'll, it'll be all right. See? Now, look, you've got to be born for that. You're born, and all natural gifts come to you. Gifts and callings are even without repentance. Like a man, like I was talking to Paul King a while ago, about like Ernie Ford and Red Ford and Elvis Presley. Those fellows have big talents of singing and using it for the world. God gave them them talents, and see what they're doing with it? Like Judas is carrying, getting 30 pieces of silver out of it. To the one who gave it to him. They ought to be using it for the kingdom of God. And when you mix it, I think they shouldn't be allowed to sing a hymn. That belongs in the church with the people, not out there to make more hypocrisy. Going to South Africa, and they say, what, Elvis Presley is a very religious boy. He sings hymns. <laughs> that doesn't mean nothing. To me, it's another Judas. And all them people that take some gifts of God and perverts them. Even to a minister, they'll take it and pervert it to a creed instead of the Word of God. And use his influence to influence by a creed and not the Word of God. It's a secondarily Judas. I don't, I want to have said that. If I hurt you, forgive me. I, I'm not supposed to say that either. All right. Here's one thing. I can say what he tells me. You pray. Now, Lord, one word from you will mean more than I can say in a lifetime. I'm believing you promising I'm yours. Let them see that your spirit is here. Then when they come up to this prayer line to be prayed for, they'll understand, Lord. A prayer of faith shall save the sick. I pray that they'll see that it isn't your servant, it's you. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 
set quiet this morning. I can't make this. You say, Brother Branham, well, I can't tell you. I only can as he shows me. Jesus said, I do nothing till the Father shows me first. What I see the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Here, if you got your heads up, look here. See, sitting out here, the little, that little lady. She's suffering with a female trouble, a lady's trouble. It's right, young lady. It's right. Drainage and everything. Is that right? Raise up your hand. You're a total stranger. The little lady, there's a light right over her sister, right at the end of the row. There's a little lady, young woman with hair. I see her at the bath. If you believe right now, now you know something happened right then. Just all at once something just went through you, wasn't it? That was your healing. See, that's just when it relieved and took away. Your faith saved you. Isn't that the same thing our Lord did? Thy, she had a blood issue, that woman. She touched his garment and turned around. He felt it. He looked. He said, it's her blood issue. She felt stopped. There's exactly the same thing Jesus Christ did. What is it? It's him. Oh, I, I know you've seen everything, but I'm, I'm only responsible for this. God's only responsible to his word. Here, that you might know, sitting right behind her is a lady sitting there with epilepsy. Has epilepsy spells. If you believe God will take the epilepsy away from you, lady, he'll do it if you'll believe it. Have faith. Don't doubt. See what I mean? Now somebody over in this section over here somewhere. So what you'll see. See, what it is, you're looking. Let me say this one thing before I go now to kind of rest myself. See, that it gets you. That's takes more strength than what I preach. Certainly. See? That's you using God's gift. If God would give the gift, uh, uh, give the, the vision automatically, like Jesus saw Lazarus dying, went away from home and waited, and then told him what would happen and went back and did it. He never said he got weak. But that one little woman, that was a woman using God's gift. It's you. God's gift, when he operates it, it doesn't do it. But when you operate it, that's when God's got you in his hands and say, this will be this way here and here and here. This is the way it'll be. That's the way it is. Don't bother you. But when that person reach in and pull that, that's what does it. That's what does it. The people today, the lady of see a church age, the last countdown. Did you see the other night just before the Pope of Rome made his first visit in all history to Jerusalem? There never has been a Pope in Jerusalem since before. See? He went from Rome to Jerusalem. The church... The moon represents the church reflecting the light of the sun in its absence. God does the signs in the heavens before he declares it on earth. Do you notice? The moon went to a complete blackout. Jerusalem is the oldest church in the world. See? And when this ecumenical council and these things, that, man, I hope you, if you're here, that this really goes to you. When you're joining yourself, don't you know you're taking the mark of the beast, my friend? Or you say, if I see it happening, it's too late then. You've done done it. It's too late at that time. Remember, they come to buy oil, but they was, couldn't do it. Did you notice? What happened? What made that moon black out? The world got in the way of it. So has the world got in the light of the Scripture. Amongst the Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostals, and all of us. That's what the blackout's for. And did you notice the lady of see a church age also? Was the only church age that Jesus was on the outside trying to get in? Did you notice? He never said, let him alone. Jesus is the Word. Is that right? The manifested Word. Now, he, uh, listen. He was not. See? Walk away and left him. But he was trying to get some cooperation somewhere. He that will open the door. I'll come in with supper with him and he with me. But no door. See? Just trying to get in on the outside. They don't reject man. They reject God. Do you believe that little lady sitting there with the sunglass on? Yes. you believe that? Mm -hmm. Had some deep thoughts right then. Your eyes will be healed if you believe it. Now, let me tell you. Someone says she's got glasses on. Reason to do it. No. Look here. Come here. Not come here. Just look at me. Do you believe me to be his prophet or his servant? You believe it? You do it. You should have, but them thought you were having them. Thinking how mysterious, what a great revelation that was of the moon representing that. Is that right? Is that right? Raise up your hand. Now, how could I know what she was even thinking in her heart? The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts that's in the heart. 
Now, pray for somebody or do something. Here, here's what pops in your heart right now. Here, here's what's in your heart. You've got two brothers that you're praying for. And they're both alcoholics. If that's right, raise up your hand. Oh, all right, so there you are. See? See, there you are. See, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Don't you see, friends? We pass speaking in tongues. We're an astronaut age. Here, here's a man right in front of her with his head bowed. He's got thin hair, wearing a white coat, got glasses on. He's got a spiritual problem that he's... John Tom. Oh, wait a minute. I know that man. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I, I know the man. That's right. I believe I, I, I met him once somewhere. I can't think of... I believe it was at Tucson. You're not long ago. I shoved your hands at a... Uh, and, and a that's right. But you're just calling God right there. you got a great spiritual problem that you don't know how to control. Look, Mr. Thomas. Don't worry. It's going to come all right. Now, that you might know that this... You said, well, he, he knew the man. Well, that's his wife sitting by him. I didn't know that was Mr. Thomas's. A problem. He, he witnessed that. But his wife sitting next to her, him there has the ear trouble that she's suffering with. Is that right? That's right. All right. Here, take the next lady. The next lady to her. Look this way, lady. You believe me to be his servant? A little lady with a red coat on. Do you believe me to be his servant? You suffer with her trouble too. You have headaches all the time. You believe God will heal him? If you do, raise up your head, uh, hands and say, I believe him. All right. That's all right. All right. If you believe it. Here, the little lady with the blue coat on sitting next to her. Do you believe, sister? You believe God can heal heart trouble and make you well? You do? All right, you can have it. The lady sitting next to her, the elderly lady, gray-headed. Do you believe God can heal too? High blood pressure and make you well? All right, you can have your healing. The lady sitting next to her, you have trouble with your ears also. You believe God heals ear trouble? Then you can have your healing. lady sitting next to her, do you believe, lady, with all your heart that God heals? Got something you're praying about? You believe with all your heart that God heals? All right. If you believe that with all your heart, your stomach trouble can be well. You can go home, eat your dinner, and be well. Mister, you sitting next to, him, to her, do you believe that, that God can heal you also and make you well? Would you accept it? How many rest of you will believe it with all your heart? Sure you will. Stomach trouble, heart trouble, God heals it all. Makes it well. That's right. If you, the man sitting next to her has got back trouble. You believe God heals back trouble, sir? You do? The lady sitting next to you has back trouble also. You believe God heals back trouble, lady? All right, you can have yours. That's right. Oh, only thing you have to do. The lady sitting next to you has got colon trouble. That's right. You believe God will heal your colon trouble, lady? You do? Here, on down the line. Look, there's a brain injury sitting there. You believe God heals brain injury? You do? You can have it. The one sitting next to you has epileptic fits. You believe God heals epilepsy? One sitting next to you has he has eye trouble. You believe God heals eye trouble, sir? One sitting next to that, that little boy, he also has epilepsy. Do you believe God heals the epilepsy? His loved one sitting there with him has trouble with her head. Do you believe that God will heal your head trouble, lady? All right, you can have it. Amen. What is it? The Word of God. For this day is sharper than a two-edged sword. Jesus Christ, an astronaut, power. You believe it. What was our first prayer card? Eight. All the people's got prayer card A. Stand up over this way. Now come quickly. Prayer card A. While the anointing is moving the way it is. Prayer card A. Um, I'll tell you what we can do. Let's... Uh, Let's stand him right down here so I can get down and pray for him down here. I believe it'd be better. Uh, go down this way, friends. Down this way so I can make a line. All prayer card A stand first. They've been holding their cards longer. Let the, everybody's got a prayer card A. Stand up over here. Billy, you go down and sit there in line. Now prayer card B. Let them follow them. All's got prayer card B. Follow A's. Go, go around through the other aisle there if you can and make your line come around that way. A, B. If you only believe, just astronaut once. Get away from the automobile and airplane. Let's go on into all things are possible. A, B. Now, anybody got prayer card C? Join right in behind them. Prayer card C. Go back at the back here. Go through this way, the middle aisle, and go across and form your line there. Prayer card A, B, C. Back this way now. That's right. Form your line right through that way. That's right. 
Turn right in this way so he can be sure to get in the line. Prayer card A, B, C. Let them line first. Just hold your card in your hand. I'll have some ushers to take your cards. I don't know how we're ever going to be lined up according to numbers. <laughs> I guess it'd be all right. It's over. It's that. A, B, C. Now D. A, B, C, D. Prayer card D. A, B, C, D. Is there any D's? I guess i done run out. Prayer card A, B, C, D. All right. Anybody's got prayer cards now? Line up. Everybody with prayer cards, get in your sections and line up. There's no way for us at all to ever be able to do, to keep them all perfectly in line by numbers. Now, I want to know how many in here is going to be praying with me while, you're, while we're praying for these sick. Listen, do you, now look, if you're going to come through over here to be prayed for, just say, well, I'll go over and see how it happens. You just might as well get your seat. It isn't going to happen. Now, he cannot do one more thing and will never do one more sign before the people. That's according to the Bible. That's right. Amen. I want somebody to tell me one more sign that he promised to do besides what he's done right here, as it was in the days of Sodom. And Malachi 4 and the promises that he made. All hoods right into the same thing. There will not be any more sign given to the church. The next thing you'll see will be a flight into heaven. They'll be taken up. Don't, don't miss it, friend. Remember, listen to my voice. It'll haunt you all your life if you haven't got it. Out yonder when you're suffering for your punishment and we're weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, that voice will stream back and forth. You hear it all the time in that weary, spooky place of hell. Don't fail. Now is your opportunity. Now, you know, there's just a minute. I wonder if I could get... Would be all you brothers pray with me and help me pray for you? Now, is these ministers over here? I, I wouldn't leave this place. Now, look, I've said some pretty rough things about airplane, automobile. Remember, they're horsepower, too. All of it's horsepower. The church is just moving up. Holy Ghost power. Is the Holy Ghost that we're justified by. You ministers know that, don't you? The Holy Ghost sanctifies us. The Holy Ghost fills us. The Holy Ghost gives us rapture and faith. See, as we move up. Now, I wouldn't leave this country here and you all thinking that you're at all oh, Brother Branham something. I am not, I ain't even worthy to set with them pastors. I, I have no schooling. I, I'm one out of season. And that's the reason God just lets me do this little thing here. Just to confirm what your pastor's been teaching you. They're a man of God. Listen, if you're sick, you don't have to wait for Brother Oral Roberts or Brother Paul King or me or anybody. Your godly pastor, his holy sanctified hands upon you. You know you called him to pray for you. He lays his hands upon you when you're burning with a fever. First thing you know in a few days, you haven't got that fever and you're well. What is it? It's your pastor's faith with yours. That's right. He's not a sideline man. He's God's servant right up in the front line with a two-edged sword in his hand. Certainly. He sure is. I'm going to ask these pastors to come here and stand with me while we pray. Will you do that? All of you? Come right here and just, I'm going to get right down with you. And let's make a double line right here. Now when the people are healed, they can't stay at seat. I want your hands, Pastor. You, my brethren. And... Now we're, you're, if you just if you come saying, "Well, I'll try," I'll no, don't do it. Don't don't take somebody else's place. Think. You come knowing that you're going to get what you've asked for. Just look here, what a bunch of ministers! Oh my! I met most of these men. I know them. I know them by meeting them at breakfasts and and uh, so forth. They're godly people. They're God's servants. Now look here. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost separated itself and tongues of fire set upon each one. The great pillar of fire separated. And each one received a portion of that Holy Spirit upon them like tongues of fire. Well, if you put one tongue of fire and two tongues of fire together, you got twice the strength that you had in one. Remember, was it Ezekiel in his vision of the two sticks in his hand, you see? 
Now look here, look here what you got. All these men of God. Besides that, how many in the audience out there is going to be praying? Raise your hand. Look at here. Now you people in the prayer line, look at this. Look out here what's going to be praying for you. Hundreds of people. Now the Holy Spirit is here right now. Jesus Christ proving himself is here. He can't do no more than that. Now how many in the prayer line believes it? Raise your hand. Now let's all. Now I'm going to have Brother Borders. Or somebody's song leader? Who is a song leader? You got the mic there? All right. Uh, I'm going to have some of them to come here and sing that song. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe. And as they sing this song, I want every person to be in prayer. Don't, don't let something outstanding happen. Don't even look up. Now, you've got to be sincere. It's between death and life to some of these people. They're right there with cancer and tumor and TB and everything dying. What if that was your mother? And somebody's remember. Now, be real reverent. And when they come by and we lay hands upon them coming right down with these men, and as they, we lay hands upon those people, you pray that they'll be healed. And now, you in the prayer line. Now, let me, I can only tell you. Now, back there, and all that will be in the prayer line, when you come through, do this now. If you're, go, if you're going to believe me, look, when you come through this line, and when the, you walk in that line, just remember it like you're walking under the shadows of the cross. Hallelujah. You're doing, these men are doing exactly what Jesus said for them to do. They shall lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. I'm coming down, as I said at the beginning, spreading my net with them. That we might do everything we can to help you people. Will you believe? Now let's pray first. Because it said, you know, Peter went and prayed in the side of the room where Darkus is dead. And then went over and laid his hands up on her. After he prayed, he got up and went over and laid hands on her. Elijah walked up and down the floor until the Spirit come on him. Then he went and laid his body on the dead baby. You remember that? Now we're going to pray and then lay hands on you as you pass through the line. And you come to here, and as soon as those hands touch you, raise up and accept your faith and go on off praising God. Be an astronaut now as you come through. Just fly away from all the unbelief. Our Heavenly Father, this comes to the climax and the crucial moment. The greatest thing can happen to the sick people is right now where a mass here of hundreds of people will be passing through a prayer line of ministers that you've called from all walks of life and they give their life to you in honor of the Word of God and their calling. Here in this box is handkerchiefs going to the sick and afflicted. Lord Jesus, let each of them recover as we send them in the name of Jesus Christ. And as these sick people come through this line, may every one of them, Lord, have faith now May they make up in their mind and say, I've been playing around. I'm not going to play anymore. If I'm going to believe, I'm going to believe right now. I've seen the living Word of God made manifest. I know in this room Jesus Christ is somewhere. Surely the one that He manifests Himself through will not tell us wrong. Or you said, if there be one who's spiritual or prophet, what He says comes to pass, then hear Him. Lord God, may that be in the people's mind that I'm trying to tell them that you are not dead, that you're living right here now. And you, your anointing is up on your church and your people. Let them be healed as they pass through. I pray this prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, let's keep in prayer while Brother Borders or whoever who's going to lead the singing, keep your heads bowed, and I'm coming down now to stand at the line here and pray with these people. Only be Only be Everyone sing. Lord, I believe all things are possible. Lord, I believe. Oh, Lord, I believe. Let's raise your hands as we sing it. Oh, Lord, I believe. Oh, things are. Uh, 
any more faith than I did in that line. Really, the finest prayer line I believe I ever had in the United States in my life, to see a line going through like that. I'm just as sure as my name's William Brannan and I'm standing here at this platform, you pastors are here about your people that went through that line. It was really a grand faith, some of the best I ever known in my life, according to the only way I have to witness it, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It was really marvelous. Thank you, people. I all that bleeds your heel say amen. 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 Listen, to that. Listen to that. God bless you. God be with you. Till I meet you again. If the Lord willing, I'll be up here at this Tularia. Is that what's the name of that? Tularia? Tularia up here this next week. Now let's all stand to our feet just a moment while we are dismissed in a regular procedure. And then they're going to give out their prayer calls here and so forth. God bless you. And God bless you ministry, brothers. That's what makes it so real. When you brothers, there was Paul Cain and all these pastors and all stand along here. A great support and faith. I've really enjoyed this meeting immensely. I consider it one of the red light meetings I've had in the United States. I've had ones that's bigger. God bless you, sister. God bless you, sister Upshaw. There isn't a week goes by that I don't think of you and Brother Bill. I'll meet you on that shore there, sister, where all the old things are passed away. We'll be there that day. Amen. Now let us bow our heads while we ask the pastor here, one to come and dismiss us in prayer officially. Let us bow our heads. Brother, the Lord bless you.